Hello, our lovely viewers. Watching us from the comfort of your home at this time. You are welcome to Joy Learning Revision Show. And the emphasis is on revision. For all levels, you are encouraged to tune in, but especially the form threes. We are by a week to face our first paper in science, and we start with biology. Today, we will look at a nice topic that most of them are familiar with. Most of them would like to try their hands at the exams or but there's a big but. If you don't tackle it well, you don't use the right words, you don't go by the rules, you may lose all marks. The topic for today is ecology. Yes, when you take your paper, you find out that in section A there are about 10 questions on ecology. If we use if we we should use the old template or blueprint, you'll find out that from question 30 to almost 40 deals with ecology, man, and the environment. In section B, usually, question 3 mostly cover this area. So if you think you are very confident and you can attempt it, you have almost 30 marks to go. And in question 5, most times the question file is spread across and surely you get an ecology question or a man and environment question. So almost 35 marks is for the graphs. If you can get over 30, then we are good to go and we can be heading in the good marks. So let's begin with today's topic, ecology. At the end of our revision, we expect students to be able to familiarize themselves with the concepts, terminologies in ecology. We then move on to the instruments to measure abiotic factors. We then move on also to try and look at soil, which is a subtopic, and also look at feeding relation, what we call energy flow in the ecosystem. Let's start with ecology. You are supposed to be able to define or explain, almost in the exams, they ask you what is any of the following terms that you are supposed to be able to use. The first is the topic itself, ecology. Ecology, we define as the branch of biology. We prefer that word, a branch of biology, because biology has many branches. So the first thing we look for is a branch of biology. What does that branch do? They study. They deal with the study of interrelationship between living organisms and their descendants. That deals with the study of the interrelationship between living organisms and their environment. Going on, we we'll look at biosphere. The whole concept of man and its environment is within the biosphere. In your GHS or whatever, you study planets. Now they say there are no more nine planets. Whatever planet we have now, among them, it's proven that life exists on only one of them called Earth, the planet Earth. So on this planet Earth, we are looking at the parts. The planet Earth is very big. Those who are able to move beyond our planet and look down will tell you that there are some parts that human beings can't leave there. So what it means is that there are some part of this earth that support life. That small part of the big earth that supports life is what we term as biosphere. That means certain space where biological activities take place. So this big earth 
It's not every place that you can find living organisms. As you travel out of space, there's a point there's no living organism. If we dig deep, deep, deep down, there's a point you can't find living organisms. So those parts may not be classified as the biosphere, but the parts that support life is what we term as biosphere. Now, study by ecologists are able to show three areas of the earth that is able to support life. The first one is the one you work on. The one that you can use your hand to collect maybe soil, where we plant things. All this part, which is the solid part, is called the lithosphere. Again, lithosphere. So we say lithosphere is the solid part of the earth. Or some will say the soil part of the earth. Now, as you walk across the entire surface of the earth, you can't walk on solid earth only. There's a point you meet water. So you have rivers, you have seas, you have lakes, you have ponds. All these parts are classified as the hydrosphere. And if you come out of your room or into the open and you raise your head up, just from where you are standing to the skies, whatever you see, the distance you see there is full of air. And that aspect of the biosphere is termed as the atmosphere, which are in layers. Now, when you take this description that we're giving to you, that there is the earth, there is the air, and there is the water portion. The world is very big. I believe we in Africa here have enough sunshine, sunlight. We say we are in the tropic. If you go to our brothers up, those in other countries where it's cold, we say they are in the temperate. So you see that there's a part that is hot, there's a part that is cold. For us in Ghana, we are in a tropic. Average, you have enough sunlight and moderate rainfall. We are not only the people on this earth that have that. So what we do is that parts of the earth that have similar climatic features or factors are all grouped as one, and we call that grouping biomes. So when you take the big biosphere, we start to group them based on particular climate condition, some animals, vegetation, a lot of things that goes into biomes. So we have the tropical rainfall, we have the savanna, we have the temperate, so we put them in that group. So you may travel to Asia and you may have a similar climatic conditions like in Ghana. Because we are the same, we can give them the same and say we are all in the tropics. You go to Brazil or Amazon, there's a portion that we in Africa and those zones are the same. So in that case, we are in the bio, same biomes. Moving on from that, this big biome that have climatic factors, including our own called the tropic. You live in the tropic. You watching me, you are in the tropic as a biome. Now, look at something. Can you swing your head and look around your room? What makes you live? I believe you are breathing in. And that air that you are breathing in is just around you. It's just around you. If it's daytime, you could see me well because of the help of light. So you could see me. The weather of late is a little bit low. So we say it's a little bit cold. All these things are just around your immediate surroundings. So when they say surrounding, it is you and anything around you. So air around you, light around you, cold or hot temperature around you. If it's even rain, they are all around you. Trees around you. Anything surrounding you 
is referred to as your environment. So the word is your environment, my environment, the organism's environment. So we speak of this from the perspective of the organism. So those in water bodies will also have their own environment. Those in the forest will also have their own environment, a lot of trees. So anything around you, anything in your immediate surrounding, the word is immediate surrounding or surrounding you, is called your environment. Moving on, another term that you're supposed to be familiar with is called the habitat. You, as a living organism, live somewhere. I believe all human beings, I don't know anybody who lives in the sea permanently called a human being because that place doesn't support us. It doesn't support we human beings living there successfully, but it supports fishes to live there. Same fishes can come to the land and live because conditions here are not good for them. So what we term as a habitat is any dwelling place for an organism in which that organism can live successfully. Again, any place or dwelling within an environment where an organism lives naturally or dwells successfully. Surely, in the atmosphere, there, should, should, there, should, there will be some organisms there that can still survive there. The desert too, there are people there or organisms there. So wherever or which place that somebody can dwell and it supports that organism, it's called the organism's habitat. But within habitats, let's take a look, let's say, on the terrestrial habitat. It's very big, wide. Let's go to, let's say, the savanna area or coastal area or a grassland. You may have grasshoppers moving around. You may have other insects moving around. But will you, you may take a closer look and uh, maybe identify something called termiterium. You see, the grasshopper or the other insects, the rodents, are all living in a good, normal condition. But on this same grassland, you are having probably a termiterium that is only for termites. So on that same environment, there is a place within this habitat that is the condition is there. Though we are in the same habitat, they have created a mini habitat with conditions that is only good for these few organisms. Such is called a micro habitat. So we say a specific place in a habitat occupied by an organism, which is only mostly conducive for them or helps them to survive successfully. So termites, we know, especially the workers, cannot face the sunlight. So they need to live in this condition of clay-like house, which is very, very good for their life. So on the same grassland, there's another habitat within the habitat. So once this habitat within the habitat, we call it the micro-habitat. Moving on, when we go into a habitat, roughly where you live is a habitat, as we are saying. In that habitat, probably in your house, you have dogs. Surely there are ants at your kitchen, cockroaches there, sometimes some rodents, some mosquitoes, plus yourself. If we decide to only focus on the ants, the only ants in your kitchen or in your house, and you want to study ants, count the number of ants there. So in counting only one species organism out of the many I mentioned in your house, then we call that in ecological study as population. So when we focus 
and be able to count and get a total number of one or a particular species within a habitat at a particular time, that count is called the population. So we move on, as I mentioned, you were in the house, you have the ant. What if I try to look at all the different species in the house? The ant, the cockroach, yourself, your dog, your cat, all together. When we do that, we call them mixture of different groups of organisms or species of organisms. Or sometimes we can say population of different species, which are living together in a habitat at the same time, then we call it a community. Again, so the difference between a population and a community is that in population, we focus on only one organism. In community, there's a lot of different organisms put together. Now, in this example I gave, the one that's so common to you in your house, the cockroach has a role to play. The mosquito, his role may be to bite you. Housefly, to help decompose food in your kitchen. Everybody, though we are in the same habitat, everybody have a role, and everybody occupy different places in your environment. So the role, the functional role, and the place that you occupy within a habitat is what we call the niche. Or some would say the niche. Any is correct. So your niche, we say, is a specific portion of the habitat or dwelling place which is occupied by a particular species or organism. Or you can also define as the functional position or role of an organism within a community. So we have decomposers. They have a role. A good example of niche is to look at a palm tree. One palm tree has many different organisms there. The fern, the moss, maybe the, some earthworms, some millipedes. Then we have beds on them. Everybody is occupying different places on the same palm tree or in a mango tree. Moving on, everybody does something different, contributes to that community. Because what I just mentioned, that there's a palm tree, there's a moss, there's a fern, there's probably millipedes, there are beds, and maybe there are ants. All these different groups forms a community on the palm tree. Everybody has a specific role. Everybody has a place they, they live. So they don't even compete among themselves as they live on a palm tree. That aspect of the ecological study is what we call the niche. Moving on again, when you take on, when you go to a community, well, how will you describe it? Probably there will be something to say that when I went to this place, I saw a lot of coconuts, maybe near the beaches. If you've traveled around the Ayukuma zone or the Krobo land, you find out that they have a lot of mangoes there. So in every community, there is one particular species that stands out as the dominant species. Usually we say that it is the one that determines the nature of the community. How, what do we mean by that? Their presence or absence will greatly affect the uh, echo balance of the community. So if you have a lot of mangoes, which brings a lot of birds, and the birds will bring a lot of maybe seeds, they will be maybe pathogens, they will bring anything there. If you cut these trees out, the birds won't come again. Maybe the litters on the ground will be no more. The soil which used to be moist now become hard. Just that group of species. 
but probably you may kill some few rodents or even kill rodents they may not change anything compared to maybe the coconut uh, the mango trees on some farms or some communities so if that particular species can determine the nature the balance the presence and absence of that species can affect the entire community then that species becomes what we call the dominant species and mostly and usually we name the community after the dominant species so you go to the north and you see that they say they have a lot of share butter trees so when you go there what you can say that place with a lot of share butter trees if you should cut the share butter trees down a lot of things will change and that becomes the dominant so not necessarily the biggest in most cases they are also the most biggest or the conspicuous one but what it actually means presence or absence will usually affect the echo balance greatly and they determine the nature of the community summon all these things all of us living well within this community it doesn't take us the living things alone to live there there are some non-living aspect of our lives which interact with us every day example you have to there has to be oxygen for you to breathe there have to be some rainfall once a while for you to get some vegetation food good temperature hot or cold they are all part of our lives it's these things that makes us survive so when it, we living things and those things i mentioned like air rainfall temperature which are not living they don't breathe they don't have cells all interact to make the community run go on smoothly live on we say the community is living when all these things take place then that system running is what we call the ecosystem again we have living things where you live and we have some non-living things that are around if if you should block all oxygen or all oxygen should deplete today i don't believe living organisms can survive so these non-living things and we the living things have to co relate or live together or interact to produce a system that everybody is balancing each other to ensure that that system around us continue then if this thing should exist then we say there's this system is called the ecosystem so an ecosystem is a natural unit made up of living organisms and non-living organisms interacting to produce a stable system and there's another point and it is self-regulating always every ecosystem usually may be stable but sometimes we destroy the stability but it is self-regulating we can't control the amount of oxygen we can't control the amount of light it regulates itself to ensure that the system goes on Now with these facts that we have now, let's look at ecological factors. We just looked at the terminologies. Now in your environment, in your habitat, in your community, you see they are in order. So the first one that comes first is the biosphere moves on to biomes which is a smaller version the environment then the community which is many then we come down to what you the population from population we can count an individual so this is the order in which we arrange it now in this community habitat or environment we have two play, two things that play out I first said there's a non-living aspect and there's a living aspect. 
We name all the non-living things. That ensures the ecosystem to go on as the abiotic factors. Yes, all the non-living things are classified as the abiotic. And all interactions or living things within or living components within the ecosystem is what we term as the biotic factors. So now we will now focus on the abiotic first and go on with the biotic. Why do you need to know this? Whether biotic or abiotic, they play a role on our behavior, our distribution. What I mean by behavior, how we react, our physiology, how our internal systems function, and how we are scattered around the earth surface. So abiotic factors that per our syllabus we should concern ourselves with is what's on your screen. I've, been, I've tried to group them into the general, the terrestrial, and the aquatic. As a revision, we're also looking at how they set questions. They've moved usually from just listing abiotic factors and then they are zoning in on specific one, the bottom of a sea, the bottom of a fresh water, the bottom of probably an estuary. Probably if you go to rainforest, you go to a deciduous area, you go to a temperate area, they want to know if among this you know how, where and how each one works. So on your left are the general ones that affect whether terrestrial or aquatic habitats. Whatever habitat, these ones can affect you. One is temperature, rainfall, pressure, light, pH, usually say acidity or base of a place. Then the oxygen concentration. Again, temperature, rainfall, wind, pressure, light, pH, and oxygen concentration. What I mentioned affects land or terrestrial organisms or ecosystem. The same thing affects aquatic. So if the question comes and it don't limit you, you are free to write these fair six because they didn't limit you. But if they should limit, and they say list abiotic factors that affect only, maybe terrestrial, only, then we have relative humidity, the land surface, the soil, and the CO2 concentration. Yes, in the sea there is, but it has not affect like we on the land. So in most authorities, they will put them here. Then we have the aquatic. If you go to the water bodies, there are some things that operate there that doesn't operate on land or doesn't have so much effect on land. So we consider it to be more skewed or more affecting the aquatic zone. One is salinity, that is the salt nature of a water body. Turbidity, how clear or transparent a water body is. The density, not all waters in the world are the same. They have different, let me use a simple word, weight. When you collect them and weigh them, because of some things in these waters, some are heavy than others. Then the current or water flow. Some flow very slowly, some are standstill, some too are fast. Then we have tidal movement. If you'll be able to visit the seashore, probably you see the waves come up to where you stand and goes back comes and it goes back. That's what we call the tidal movement. And the entire big ocean have serious wave or tidal movement. Then we have dissolved gases. We have dissolved gases. Then we also have the nature of the substrate. That is the underlining rocks or probably the nature of the soil under. It's also a factor of aquatic habitat. 
what we will do now is to try and also regroup this one according to climatic factors, physiological or physiographic factors, then edaphic factors. So in things that affect our climate, usually our temperature, our rainfall, our relative humidity, wind, and light. What's the physiological or physiographical factors are the altitude, the slope, and exposure. Then edaphic mostly deals with the land nature, our soil, and the nature of the soil. So if they move away from water, uh, aquatic, and terrestrial, the next zone is this area to know how you would arrange them. Now, knowing these abiotic factors, we would have to also know how to measure them and know how to use the instrument. It is what in our syllabus you call a skill you are supposed to know as a student. Maybe you were taking through, maybe you were not taking through. We we'll just run through these few ones. Now, rain gauge. The job of a rain gauge is to measure rainfall. The job of an anemometer is to measure the speed of wind. Once there's a meter, then that means there's something like a rate. The wind vane measures the direction of a wind. A sechi or seki dex measures the turbidity or transparency of water. Sorry on your screen. It's written as wind. It's water. Then we have thermometer to measure your temperature. Then we have maximum and minimum thermometer, another type of thermometer that measures atmospheric temperature. Then we also have a barometer that measures pressure. We will also look at the pH of the soil. How do you measure it? Or pH of a medium. We use the pH meter or calorimeter. Then relative humidity is measured by hygrometer. Then the slope of a land is also measured by slope gauge or we call the plumb line. Then, as usual, the distance that you cover on the land or you want to measure something, we use a meter rule. The light or sunlight, because we are using sunlight here, because mostly the ecology is in the environment, but any light that I want to measure, we use the photometer. Or mostly can say light meter is accepted. Then we have light intensity. We use the light intensity probe. Then we want to measure light in water, we use the hydrophotometer. We are going to move on to how to use these things. Some old past questions have asked students to use this, uh, ask them how they use this, and they may look for how to use it and the precautions. We just selected a few to go through. So let's look at the pictures first. I'll describe the picture, then later give you a minute to read the notes on it. Now, the photometer light. If you want to measure light, let's say this is in the open. Uh, it's not, let's say me, I'm holding a phone. It's not like raising it up. To the light rather you put a white paper on the ground or the surface of the land because it's white we believe that light will hit on it and reflect back so you look at the angle you position at an angle hoping that when it reflects that means the same 
intensity is what you are measuring, then you're able to measure the light rays. You're able to measure the light intensity too. So on your screen, you have a diagram of how we use it and how we read using light. Now the temperature too on your screen, the thermometer on your screen, it measures temperature. The one you are seeing here is the soil thermometer. So you try to dig maybe a not so an open place. We look for shaded area where the temperature is. We assume it's a little bit constant. Then you dig the ground. You put this one in to measure your soil thermometer, soil temperature. Now let's look at our rain gauge. You can make a makeshift one in your school. Look for a bigger beaker, the big ones, and look for a small one and look for a funnel. Then on your screen, on your right, you dig a portion of a land. Don't push it too deep. Make sure it comes a little bit up so that soil water will not flood it when it rains. So what you do is that you set this one, we have an inner a funnel, a metal cylinder, then a cut down measuring cylinder, which has collected some water in there. So you put it there, you wait when it finish, uh, after rain, you go to pick your thing. There's a calculation we use. So you go through the calculation, you're able to record the amount of rainfall for the day. And you have to do it over, over, over some time. You're able to measure the rain pattern of your environment. Now this, what we call the Sechi Dex or Sechi Dex. It's a heavy plate and they put a weight or fix on it a weight. Then they've tied it with some strange, we call it knotted strings. Then the student on your screen is trying to show us how to use it. So you have to release this so you can't see it again. So you note where you couldn't see it again to help you the transparency or we say the clearness or cloudiness of a water body. Next on your screen too is your minimum and maximum thermometer that measures the highest temperature of a day and the lowest temperature of a day. So you see your weather service people come on our screen and they're able to give us the weather will be like this today. We are spent to be 23 to 33 or the yesterday's weather was that. They're able to measure the two extremes during the entire 24 hours. So they use a maximum and minimum thermometer and your middle screen is your hygrometer, a picture of it. And the last on your right is your barometer. So how to use, as I described along, the rain gauge is mounted on a little elevation to clear it from flood on an open land. Then you set up your can. When the rain stops, you pick and do your calculations and get your reading. A meter rule, you want to measure the height of a building or a wall, you know how to put it by the side. If it's on the bare ground, you know how to put your tape measure or meter rule on the ground. In the anemometer, the one that has some caps on, you set it on a, a, an elevated place 
so that when the wind blows, the caps will, we say, will catch the wind, and the force of the wind will whirl it around. And there will be a meter around it to measure the speed at which it turns around. And that is how we measure the wind speed. So these are all on your screen. We've spoken about it. I give you a minute to read through. Okay, let's go on. Now, when you know how to use this, we also want to know the effects. When I start, I say it's abiotic factors. It affects because in the ecosystems, there's an interaction between living and non-living things. So the non-living, as I said, is the abiotic. What effect do they have on either other living things or even sometimes other abiotic factors. So let's start with light. We've chosen a few to look at. And this one, when you are asked in the exams hall, take your time. They are just asking you how observant you have been through these three years, either from your environment or from the notes or whatever you've taught you in class. This is where students rush a lot and words like help, don't bring it in the exams. Don't write anything like it aids, it ensures, it helps, it facilitates. Don't bring that. You just start that, and that is wrong. Take it from me. When we mark, we don't like the word help. Tell us how it does it. Who stop? So you know things about photosynthesis, and it's primarily done by what? Light. Transpiration, when you study your transpiration, you know that it controls what? Stomata opening. Light can control stomata opening. That's why in the evening we say there's no transpiration or stomata don't open. Then some plants and some organisms grow well when there's light. So in certain countries, seasonal. So when there's enough light, life is there. Then light also affects movement of organisms. Those who are nocturnal, those who are diurnal, these are controlled by light. What about wind? You know what wind does? Evaporation of water from surfaces of pond. You were taught factors that affect transpiration. One is wind. So when they ask you this, take your time and go through little of things you know that we mentioned wind, we mentioned light, and be brief and straight to the point. So we did something like cross-pollination, and most times we know it's wind that carries the pollen grain from one place to the other, if it's a cross-pollinated plant. Soil erosion, this can be water or can be wind. So bring all good and bad, bring it. Then they carry airborne, diseases. What about temperature? So far, we've studied a lot of things on temperature. Like I said, light, we have diana and nocturna. Same in temperature, we have poikilothermic and homeothermic organisms. So that's, those who are poikilothermic, they, their body temperature is controlled by changes in their environment. So if the environment goes up, they become hot. If the environment comes down, their body temperature drops, like the lizard. So temperature has a role. Then when the weather is cold or very hot, when it's very cold, human beings, we put on our cardigan and sweaters. But in animals, they need to find something else to do. That process of hiding in the crevices, in canals, in blocks, or whatever, or when it's hot, how they also live their life. It's termed hibernation and estivation. So temperature can make some hibernate or estivate. And here the temperature I'm using is that it can be high temperature or low temperature. So state it well. Low 
leads to what? Hibernation. High leads to estivation. Then bacteria in decomposition is highly controlled by optimal temperature. Rainfall. Now rainfall, when it rains, flooding. When it rains, all dirty water, water should be kind of a little bit clean because it will come and just push away the bad ones and new ones settle in. In that case, you say the water becomes a little bit clear or become clearer, and we say turbidity becomes high. Say when it rains, plants will get water, you yourself will get water for organisms use it to drink. Mosquitoes will breed in it. Algae like the sparagia will grow. Bryophytes will reproduce. So any little thing we've taught you in class, that comes with this. Please write them. Then relative humidity. Now, humidity means the moisture amount, the amount of moisture in the air. If it's too much, we say high relative humidity. If it's very low or you don't have so much, it's low relative humidity. What happens, what is its role? One of them is water loss from plants or transpiration. And if the humidity is very low, it means that there's less moisture in the environment. Plants, certain plants have to adapt. When it's good, others live with it. When it's bad, others will have to adapt. Those who adapt are called a zero fight in low humidity. Now, these ones are very easy to answer. Usually, what they would like to test you in the exams is the effect of one biotic factor against another. So if it rains, what happens? If it rains, temperature, assuming the day was very hot, the temperature will drop. Or having to relative humidity, it will increase. So if they ask you the effect of rainfall on other abiotic factor and its effect on the ecosystem. So you are just going to start with rainfall after rain, temperature would reduce. And when temperature reduces, what is the effect? If humidity also reduces, or sorry, humidity becomes high after a rain, what is the effect? This is how they mostly like asking the question. Or they ask you, the effect of temperature on other abiotic factor. If temperature is high, then relative humidity will be low. What happened to rain? If temperature is very high, we assume there will be high evaporation, and maybe in some few days, it will set up rainfall. So know how to relate these factors. Now, the next, we are done with the abiotic, the non-living things, and its effects in the ecosystem. Now, the biotic factors. Biotic means life. So we, from our point of view, we are the point of discussion. Abiotic, fact, abiotic factors. That means we as a living organism, the effect of either our life on another living organism or another living, on, another living organism on our lives. I'm not a human being as the only life. So we look at one organism, its effect on another organism. So on your screen, we have tall trees, shelter or shade, certain other plants, usually below them, or it serves as shade for animals. So the tree is a living organism, the animal is a living organism. So immediately you sit under a tree to cool off, then biotic factor is taking place. If you feed, if you see goats chewing grass, one is a living organism feeding another living organism. It's biotic factors. Pollination. Insects pollinating flowers. Two living organisms interacting. Dispersal of seed by animals. You eat your mango, you throw away, helps the plants disperse things. Then 
we have symbiotic relationship, whether mutual, commensal, parasitic, epiphytic, whatever types. It involves two organisms. Now, some plants burrow in another organism's body to hide there. Then there's two important aspects you're supposed to know, competition and predation. As much as it's not a direct, some it's direct, some it's not direct, the effect of another living organism will affect how you live. Let's say a tiger and a lion, all looking for food. They may not kill each other directly, but they will compete. And if one can get food quicker than the other, it's going to affect how the other lives. So it then also moves on to the next point, predation. Where, as I said, a lion can kill another organism like, let's say, a goat to eat. It also has effect on their population, their growth, their migration. So every one organism has an effect on the other. That effect between living organisms is what we call the biotic factor. So we would go for a break now before we go to our second subtopic, which is soil. Now I'll go over what we just did. If you have any problem, you can call in. Then also be ready that you have a problem of the day. When we come back, keep listening well to guide you to answer the problem of the day. So let's go for a break. And we'll be back very soon. anniversary we say congrats and keep up the good work you are doing we wish you success in the future and i know that Ghanaians are expecting more from you two might sound very soon in a way but joining has done a lot and on this note i would want to wish joining a happy two-year anniversary the whole country is now into it they are watching joy learning they are learning so i would only say that it should continue and it should work harder than before i hope that many more students will find it not just as an appendix but as an integral part of their learning experiences and let's encourage our wards or our kids to watch joy learning so they learn something better because day in day out new things are being taught for mathematics in particular i look forward to the day when because of joy learning and every other such intervention mathematics would not be feared it would be revered respected loved i mean the kind of subject that you don't run away from when you hear it, but you embrace it joy learning joy learning joy learning joy learning joy learning joy learning
vacation and desperately want to catch up with the syllabus, slow, slow. Don't fret because Joy Learning is giving you free extra classes not only on TV but on Zoom. Did you encounter any challenges with certain topics at school? Bring them here and we will help you get it solved with no sweat, Charlie. We are offering you a one-on-one teaching and learning opportunity with our award-winning TV teachers. Is it mathematics, general science, English language or any of the elective subjects that you have challenges with? Meet our teachers for easy solutions. How do you join these free extra classes on Zoom? One, download the Zoom app from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Two, create your username. Three, look for our Zoom meeting password on all our social media handles every week. And voila, you are good to join our virtual classroom from the comfort of your home. Make a date this Saturday with your facilitator at 12 noon prompt. The Joy Learning teacher and you, we don't stop learning. Joy Learning, keep learning. Yeah, hello, welcome back to our study. For those who missed the first part, we looked at biotic and biotic factor in ecological terms. Before I go on, we are streaming live on YouTube. You can go to Facebook, Twitter, or TikTok. Just type in Joy Learning TV. You can join us with all your comments and also contribute. Instagram to your Joy Learning TV. Then our telephone number for today, when it gets the time for you to call, is 0302-11705 or 0302-211706. Okay. One student once asked a question. They believe they write biology well and they fail. Or when they use the word fail, they expect to get A easily, B or B3. Three things that you are supposed to take note. One, biology has its language. If you don't get the language well, you may write something that to you makes sense. You will interpret it differently. And biology is not an exact science, it's a component of different fields put together. So you go to genetics, they have their language. You come to plant, they have their language. You go to cell, they have their language. So you have to be shifting between terms and language. Then if you don't write to, we have to precise and concise, and we are more descriptive. We are careful. Cautious about petty, petty mistakes, spelling, all these things. And the last is follow instruction. If they say in a tabular form, put it in a table. They say describe. They didn't tell you to draw. Describe. Don't draw. So that you write an experiment and you draw a womb market, unless the instruction was there. Then don't be a lay person. Don't say brush your teeth. And you think you are supposed to brush your teeth and get it correct? No. You brush with what? How many times? What do you use to brush? So you use a toothbrush with a toothpaste. Brush twice daily. This is what we want. So you can't speak like a lay person. So let's go on with our next lesson, soil. And... We, we define soil, the nice thing that you can use your hand to scoop a little and just let it go. You find out that the wind can easily blow it away because the particles are fine. So we see they are finely divided mineral or inorganic and organic materials that cover the surface of the earth. Again, is the finely divided organic and inorganic materials that cover the surface of the earth. 
we get this soil from weathering of rocks when bigger rocks beneath us through a lot of processes will break they keep pushing up pushing up and break into pieces then we get this soil now this soil remember the definition is organic and inorganic that means there's a living part and a non-living part so on your screen is a table showing the components of the soil and we gave the importance of these components the first part we are supposed to know there are six components six components of a soil the first is the soil particle size or the soil particles then the importance of soil particles is that it forms the bulk of the soil and serves as a place for plant growth or anchorage first thing is for mostly this relates to more plants than this plant that's where their homes are that's where they hook with their roots the next is their mineral salts anytime mineral salt we talk about mineral salt it's not something extremely big what you study in chemistry the carbon the sodium the hydrogen the nitrogen all these are the mineral salts we talk about the soil particle itself that you see silicate or aluminium whatever these ones the soil itself is made up of elements so it's the particle you are holding it's a chemical thing you are holding so it has minerals in it and what is the function of these elements we eat to get the purpose of eating is to get elements to keep adding on to ourselves ourselves to be able to survive or to grow any of them so what the plants also take from their soil is the mineral element so <laughs> mineral elements are in your soil and their function is for healthy growth of plants there are spaces when you take some amount of soil if it is not a crammed up type and it's like loamy soil you'll be able to see spaces in between the soil these spaces are called the air space or mostly filled with oxygen what's the function of this air or oxygen for respiration of organisms the next is that space at a point in time can also be filled with water so there is an amount of water in soil at any time or at one point in time sometimes we think it's so dry so there's almost no water but if you go through your notes well you come through hygroscopic water capillary water uh, land table water all these things you find out that some one of them is almost strongly held on to the soil very difficult to move them for the plant use then the next is organic that's the living aspect humus organic matter we mostly get this humus organic matter through the composition and once we die what does it do all living organisms have a lot of nutrients in our bodies either in our cells or every part of our body when we die we have the composers that would break down these things at the process they turn our dead bodies into humors and once it turns your the nutrients in our body is released into the soil and we say there's recycling of nutrients so the nutrients are made available through the formation of humus so that plants can get nutrients for growth then we have living organism not dead one this one living one so once they were living when they died they would go into dead organic and become humus now the living ones mostly classify them into two macro and micro micro are as you know microorganisms small our eyes can see like bacteria and protozoa that work in the soil 
Then you have macro like the earthworm, the millipede, centipede, all these ones are macro organisms. And what their job? As they try to find shelter or pass through the soil, they create pores or holes in the soil that makes air easily circulate, and we call it aeration. And as I said, if there's aeration or if there are good air spaces, water can also fill the air spaces. Now let's look at soil. One of the we'll concentrate on two aspects of the soil component. The first is the soil particle. A popular question that usually comes in that in section A, section B, or in practicals. You have you will be required or they'll give you a sample soil to put in a measuring cylinder. You pour water on it. They allow you to shake it for a while, then put it down for about 30 minutes for it to settle. What will you see? What is the aim of that experiment? The first is the particle size. Though you went to scoop it or even use maybe a machine or something to pick it, you may pick it in a certain arranged form in the soil. But this form has already have different sizes, mixed up at different horizons as we study in uh, soil profile. But we want to know all the type of soil particles there. The easiest approach is the sedimentation. Hello, Jennifer. Yes, Welcome. Where are you calling us from? We missed or we lost Jennifer. Call back. Let's continue. Now, when you shake it, because water would disperse all or scatter all the particles randomly those which are heavy will settle first and most heavy ones most times are also bigger so big and heavy settle followed by the next till we get to the smallest then after the smallest the water portion will fill the top then on the surface you get what we call the humus then you have suspended material so on your screen we have a drawing showing the sizes, the names, and everything. So the one that will descend at the bottom are the gravels. And we say the size about 2.0 millimeters. So look at your ruler and look for 2 millimeters. That's the biggest among them. Then the sand has a range of 0 0.02 to 2.0 millimeters. So in that order, Hello, Ernest. Yeah. Welcome. Where are you calling us from? I'm yeah, from Atlantia, Chihuahua. Yeah. Is there any question you want to ask? Yeah. Go on, please. Is there any question you want to ask? The meaning of the soil proof. Soil, come again. Soil proof. Soil proof. Okay, yeah. we say it's a vertical cross section layer that, so if you have a soil and there's something we push in, so when we dig, let me use the phone, assuming there's a whole soil and we're able to dig smoothly through, we want to look at the nature of the soil in its original soil in the soil. Listen to it well though. We want to look at the soil side here, the layers. You may see brown, deep brown, this, rocks, as it's arranged in the natural soil. It's different from the sedimentation we are doing. The sedimentation is just you take it and you shake everything. So what it means is that some will have small, maybe small particles and big ones here. Some will have small particles and big ones down here. Some will have small and big ones down here. Once you shake it, 
it would rearrange all the particles. But the soil profile is just give a vertical arrangement of the layers of the soil in the natural soil in the ground. Okay. okay. Can I ask you another question? Go on. Uh, the difference is between the soil particle and the soil profile. And that's what I just explained. Soil particles are the sizes. Uh, profile is that at any point, there's a mixture of these particles, depending on composition, color, anything at a point in the soil profile. So when we take it, we have top soil, we call it A, B, C, and D. It's not the same as soil particles, but soil particles are arranged in a certain composition to form a soil profile. So the soil particles contain the gravel, sand, and the everything. Can you reduce or mute your TV and listen or ask your questions directly? Okay. Okay. Let's go on. And then the soil profile it contains uh, the subsoil, the topsoil, the weathered rock, and the parent rock all together in the subsoil. So that's why I say a vertical, like you are digging slowly down till you get to the bottom of it. Okay. Okay. You just write you you wrote smoke on last week, and then it came. That's why I'm asking. Oh, okay. That's good. So that's the answer for you. Okay. Okay, let's go on our viewers. So that's, I think your friends, or colleagues' question has also answered most of you, your problem. Different between soil particle and soil profile. So what we have on this screen is sedimentation to get soil particles in a soil. The other option, if you don't use it, is to look for a sieve that you know the sizes of this, so that you keep sieving them according to sizes, till you get whatever you will get for each sieve. Then you can even measure the density, the mass of each particle in a soil. So most times, WASI in practicals will require that, if it's practical, they require you to draw this And you know, we went through drawing, has to have a title. You have to draw according to the size, neatness of label, everything. Then you label it, and most of the time they will zoom in in one of the particles and ask you its importance. Another component usually they ask is soil water. How do you determine soil water? So first is, you go to the, the natural environment, you pick your soil first, a quantity of them. You weigh it, you know the weight, let's say, let's say you go and you pick one, so you give A1. Hello. We lost our color. Okay, so you go for your soil, you bring it to your lab or to your classroom, you look for a clean crucible or something you can weigh on. Weigh the crucible first. Know the weight. So let's say the crucible is 10. Then you put on the soil itself. You pour a lot, uh, amount onto the crucible. Let's say the soil, you get 35. Now, 35 means that it has with the crucible. So to get only the soil, you need to subtract the crucible from it, which you get it as 25. So A3, which will be now minusing the, uh, the weighed crucible and the soil from the crucible, means you have only the soil itself. That will be 25. Then you put this crucible and soil into an oven and heat it at 100 degrees 
maybe for 30 minutes, do it again. You, after that, you weigh. Do it again till you get a constant weight. At that time, we believe that everything is gone. So if, assuming you finish that and you got 18, it means that the original weight, which is 25, which has dropped to 18, means that something has gone out. That portion that has gone out is believed to be the water portion. Because that's the moist one. So when you put in oven, the heat will dry it and the water portion goes out. So this is how we get soil water, the calculation for soil water. So you wear a clean thing, half fill with soil, reweigh it with the soil together. Then you subtract, you get the weight of the soil. Put in an oven, heat it for some time. Then when you get a constant temperature, you use the formula on your screen, believing that the amount or the difference is equal to your water, soil water in the soil. Now, our syllabus also requires to know much about soil fertility. Every soil, we say, is good for something. But in general terms, a soil that is good is said to be fertile. So we define soil fertility as the ability of a soil to supply all factors needed, such as proper nutrient in the right amount, the right balance, for the growth, now the word is a specific plant. As I said that, no soil is actually bad. Every soil is good for something. So the ability of a soil to supply all the factors. Now for that specific plant, to the factors needed for that specific plant, all the factors, that's proper nutrient in the right amount and in the right balance for a specific plant. Such soil, we assume, should be well aerated. There should be good water retention capacity. There should be adequate humus in there. There should be enough or adequate mineral nutrients. There should be correct proportion or mixture of the soil particles. And there should be good drainage system. Now, this fertility characteristic I gave can be destroyed by a lot of other factors. So once these things are destroyed, then we say that the soil is no more fertile, it has become infertile. One of them is erosion, the washing away of the topsoil. Once you wash the topsoil, you wash away nutrients. Then you wash away some quantity of the soil itself. So anchorage and everything become a problem. Deforestation, once you cut down trees, you expose the topsoil to direct sunlight, rain, wind, and that leads to what? Nutrient carried away, strong sunlight, killing microorganisms, and all these things will affect the, nutrient, uh, the fertility of a soil. Bush burning will kill what? Microorganisms also would deplete essential nutrients, would also reduce water holding capacity because you are going to then, we also have contour cropping or overcropping, sorry, continuous cropping. In continuous cropping, you plant the same plant continuously on the same land for a long period. The main problem is that they, they exhaust nutrients or they take a lot of nutrients from the soil. So most times, you have to use fertilizers, either natural or artificial, to overcome this. But you keep planting over there, over there for 10 years. Every year you are planting, surely the same thing too. It will deplete the soil there and reduce soil nutrients. Another is overgrazing, where there's cattle and other eating the grasses. And the same thing, the grass serves as cover crop. Once you chew them, it exposes the soil, 
leading to rainfall. Then chemicals, although I mentioned fertilizers and other chemicals, excessive use of them can rather destroy the soil structure. I spoke of monocropping, and the last is soil compacting. We do it, we human beings. Animals do it. We mostly take a path somewhere. We walk over there to create a path. What you do with tramping on that soil area is that you compact the soil, reduce the space, reduce everything there, and that means drainage becomes a problem. Once drainage becomes a problem, the surface of that compacted soil will collect water, like waterlogged. Once it becomes waterlogged, there will be anaerobic respiration of either microorganisms in there, leading to denitrification. Hello, Listo. Yes. Welcome to our program. Where are you calling us from? From Navrongo. Wow, Navrongo. Uh, we'll get to a session of the question, but is there any problem or any question you want to ask for clarity? Yes. Okay. So please, so please, what if the measurement is not correct? As in the exams? Yes. Okay, we'll look at steps. You are talking about the water holding calculation. Hello. Listo, are you talking about the water holding, water yes. content in the soil? So what we do is that, depending on how the exams we ask it, sometimes they say stay the experiment, write the experiment. If you write the experiment, we'll follow in order. But in the experiment, if you miss one point, we'll stop at where you miss the point. Then we'll mark down again. That's what we do. So if there are seven points, and let's say you miss it on the third point, we stop marking at the third point. So you get, let's say, three. But the calculations, we'll start with A1 is this, A2 is that, A3 is that. We will follow it. Sometimes we know you may make a mistake. So we have a, the max. So we'll give formula, we'll give your data. We'll look at substitution. If there's something wrong with it, uh, there's a way we go about it. Though that last one, you won't get the full mark. But if you feel everything was there, and you don't know what you did wrong, we just don't mark the last one. We mark steps. Okay, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Let's go on. Now, method of... If now we studied all what causes soil infertility, how do we conserve this soil fertility? One is bush burning. We have to avoid bush burning, avoid overgrazing. Then we said it, apply... I put in bracket green green manure, more than the artificial one. Then proper, uh, then the next one is still on artificial. First one was green manure, next one is artificial, but we say proper application. So not excessive, not in the wrong way, proper. Okay, now practice strip cropping, they also practice mulching. Mulching means spreading something maybe rubber, litter on the surface of the soil. What you do is that, hello? Yeah, hello. Yeah, okay, your name, please. Yeah. Your name? Please, my name is Sinyani Kodro Baswa. Okay, Kodro. Where are you calling us from and your please, question? my name is Sinyani Kodro Baswa. Okay, calling us from? Please, what is the difference between macro and micro? Organisms. Okay. Micro, let me start, let me watch the screen, let me write something. Micro, like this, means tiny. Macro, means big. So things you can't see with your eyes like bacteria. I hope you, you are following me. Things you can't see with your eyes, called micro, mostly you need the microscope yes, to look at it, like the bacteria in the soil, rhizobium, nitrosomonas, azotobacter, all these ones belong to micro. Macro are big, large ones your eyes can see. Have you seen an earthworm before? Okay. Okay, so earthworm millipede centipede belongs to macro, big. 
No. Uh, uh, don't follow the uh, what is going on, on your TV. Follow yeah. me, ha. Huh? So macro means big or mm. large. Okay. So we have centipedes, earthworm, ants. We put ants here, and we put bacteria at micro. So mm. this is the difference. So your eyes can see the other one. Your eyes cannot see them. Okay. okay, thanks. You're welcome. So let's go on. So if now this question, I brought these two questions on your screen. And let's take one minute and look at what we mostly want students to do in the exams. They know you know anything about soil fertility, soil days, you understand. So we narrow down. Overgrazing. I just said overgrazing is a cause of soil infertility. How does overgrazing cause that? Bush burning. How? How does it contribute to soil infertility? So when uh, goats just chew the surface, uh, the grasses from the surface of the land, what happens? We say that it reduces vegetation cover. Okay. Distraction of food chain. We desertification, if they keep in one place of desertification. Reduction. The, you see, as the grass grows, a lot of microorganisms find habitat, live there. But if you eat all this and the place become bare, and all the things that support the microbes life are no more, they will move from this dry place. Then exposure of topsoil to soil erosion. Then as they walk, as they walk, their foot would bring compactness of the soil. So Waiye could test your ability to apply. This is an application question. Now let's look at another one. Effect of bush burning. What does it do? Yes, farmers do burn their bush. What does it do? It destroys the soil. It encourages what? It kills organisms. The soil becomes a little bit alkaline after burning. Then weeds, you, are, you, want to plant, you want to burn the place and later plant something. Some weeds, it rather helps some other plants to grow. So weeds that you are not ready for, rather sprout first. So all these ones also are part of it. It leads also to denitrification, leads to air pollution when you burn. So it destroys soil structure. So these are some questions that we test mostly for five marks. We test how you reason. Now let's get the positive one. How cover cropping aids in conservation of soil. This is what we look for. You see, I've Underlying something called setting there. We argued that if a student say growth of a plant or a crop, a crop can be anything. But we need specific plants or crops like the legumes, crotalaria, sweet potato, those with the broad surfaces that usually creeps on the ground. This is what we wanted. And what does it do? It holds the soil. Yes. Hello, say. Hello, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. are you calling us from and how can we help? I'm calling from Mambong. Okay. Your question, please. My question is, according to what uh, the tutor was saying, he said anything you can see and touch is a micro substance. Okay, this and way. Anything, let me, mm -hmm, let me, things that you need to see with the help usually of microorganism, uh, microscope. Let's okay, okay. put it in the perspective. Mm. Things you, you cannot see without the help of my, uh, micro. microscope. Microscope. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. I, I have to understand. I'm confused about 
What about the microphone? Because that one too, we see and such, but we, we <laughs> have some name micro. Yeah, microphone. I don't know why they named the microphone. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Let's go on. Now, the root of cover crops bind soils together. Then the same leaves will do what? Reduce the impact of the soil. When these plants also die or we approve them, their leaves will decompose into the soil. So we are testing students' application. You walk around, you see it. We are testing that. But students were struggling. And use of the word straightforward, a bind soil. It has, so bind and let to hold soil together. Our language is some way. To so bind soil particles together. It prevents leaching. This is what we wanted. So some experiments on soil retention, and we are going to use the experiments to ex the explain. Usually, we want to know the porosity and the retention ability of soil. So what we do is that we take same amount of different types of soil, and we heat it to they've all lost their water ability first. We look for measuring cylinders. We put in our funnel, and we put a cotton wool at the neck and pour the same amount of soil into it. Then we pour the same amount of water to all the three measuring cylinders. We time. Time is of essence here. We time. Let's say one hour. Look at which of the measuring cylinders fill up very quickly. And you see that the sand. Hello. Hello. You are welcome. Thank you. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Fade. Fade, okay. Uh, your question, please. Please, I want to know the differences between leaching and soil erosion. Okay. In leaching, uh, let's assume you have a bucket full of soil. Okay. And the top, you've put, set, let's say, salt there. You know salt? Yeah. Then you pour water onto the salt on the soil. What do you think will happen? Let's say if the soil, the bucket is big, you put it at the top. Let's go over again. Let's say you put a sieve. You know a sieve? Yes. You put soil in it. Then you put salt on top of it. Then you pour water. What do you think will happen after maybe one hour? Please, the question again. Kindly mute your, the, uh, the volume of your TV. I'm saying that assume you have soil and yeah. you put uh, salt on top and you pour water onto it. What would the, what, the water do to the salt? It will dissolve. Then after a while, what will happen to the water itself? It will penetrate the soil and go to the bottom, isn't it? Yes. Yes, that. So let's take the soil, the soil to be nutrient. So once it will penetrate and the bottom, you can still find the salt solution. Then by passing from the top to the down, it's called the leaching. So we leach from top to what? Down. <laughs> but carrying the surface is like taking your hand to scoop an amount of soil away and throw it somewhere. And that one is erosion. <laughs> so erosion is carrying and throwing away. Leaching is water draining down to the bottom. That is leaching. <laughs> and when they are doing that, they carry along nutrients. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, my dear. Hello. Hello. Oh, we lost our caller. So let's finish this quickly. So this is how we set up permeability and water retention. So the one that have plenty of water in their, capillary, uh, their measuring cylinder means that it's very porous and water is lead drains. The one with less like the clay means that a lot is still held on top of the 
water added clay. And that means a high water retention ability. Now let's look at permeability. How John. Yes, please. Yes, you are welcome. Thank you. Yes. Your yeah. question. It's a clarification I want. Okay. Uh, beginning of the lesson, you said if you ask to describe something, and then you ask to draw something. Yeah. Yeah. I think describing something, you can bring the drawing inside. Okay. Now, whenever you best describe it, but if you ask to draw, you only just to draw it, but to describe it, I think the drawing should be there okay. so that it will give you a clear description of okay. what you have been asked. Okay. Let me, that one will be okay. okay, let me talk as an examiner for a long time. You may draw, nobody would stop you. But we don't mark the drawing if you didn't ask you. But usually that one calls for good description of what you asked. No problem, but you don't mark it. And take okay. it from me. So, for example, students will say, uh water cycle after mm -hmm. then he will draw he didn't ask you he will mark it okay a typical example is photosynthesis sometimes few times you have agreed for the equation but most times they say describe or explain photosynthesis you don't finish and put the equation you won't mark it let's say you ask to cross pollination for instance mm -hmm. and if you ask to describe cross pollination i think if the fellow draw it, then shows all the uh, that one too yeah. will be better. Okay, don't worry. Mm, but yes. Like the drawing should be part of the description. Don't worry, but we don't. Okay. So take it from me. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let's finish this and go to our prime of the day. So this is how we set up capillary, so uh, capillarity of soil. We want to know which one does the water climb up quickly. And on your screen, you see clay on your far right as the one that. So you have, you can use uh, measuring cylinders, turn it upside down, put your dish, put a bowl there. You have your cutting wood, the same cutting wool will be at the mouth. You pour the soil in upside down, then you dip them in, time it, and see how far which one would rise first. Hello. Hello. Oh, we lost our color. So on your screen is the properties of sandy, clay, and loam, and how we uh, describe them. So capillarity in sandy is, we say it rise very fast, but not high. Clay rise slow, but very high. Loamy is medium. For water retention, we did the first test. We saw that clay have small pores. So it keeps a lot of water on top, while sand will drain fast. Loam is still medium. In proportion, sand has a lot of, our 90% plus full of sand particle. When we did the sedimentation, we saw particles there. So sand particles. Then clay, clay to us, clay particles. So go and check the sizes. Then in loam, it's an equal composition. Compactness, we say that sandy soil is loose, while clay is very close or very compact. Loam is medium. Then weight of soil, sand is very light, clay is heavy. Then loam, say medium. Plowing difficulty, easy to plow on sandy soil, you just put a hole in. Then clay, very difficult and hard to do. Fast, loam is medium. So due to time, the bonus, we couldn't treat our bonus to which was food chain and stuff. Maybe next time we'll do it, but we'll move on straight to our question of the day, or prime of the day. So we'll move on to question of the day. And I think our producers will put the original version on your screen for the day. So what we did at Biotic and Abiotic has been brought here. 
We say study the study carefully diagram C D and C D E and F below. Awuni. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Where calling us from? Uh, this is from uh, Reading. Okay. Your question, or you want to answer our Thank question? You, uh, please, I want to ask a question. Okay. Uh, please, uh, sometimes students don't normally become confused the difference between what is and the sky. Okay. So when you ask them to decide a particular thing, they normally want to relate it to the meaning of what is. So when you say what is, they normally ask, say, what it means is entails a lot. And the sky too is entails a lot. So are they the same cousins or they are slightly different? Okay, thank you. Usually this one comes with a question, but let me start with describe. In most description, we mostly aim at how you've observed something well, and you write in order. If it's an organism, let's say amoeba, you should write from the outside slowly to the inside and you describe it vividly for the person to understand. If it is me, you describe from my head, my neck, my shoulder in chronological order. It has to make sense. In what is, they are asking you what you know. Usually, it doesn't follow specific trend. So far, you've marked, it doesn't follow specific. So what is photosynthesis? If they don't limit you, you mostly use the marks aside it to know how to write it. Maybe two, three, four marks. It tells you how to. But if they say describe, let's say an organism, uh, a process, always has to be in specific order. Yes, that's description. And then when you do description, they don't want their functions a lot. Most of you don't want, oh, my head is this, or I have eye, and you want to go deep. Maybe eye for vision, fine, but you don't stress yourself. Usually, check what's at the side. So what is, doesn't have a, a plan, but the thing has to be there. So mostly what students do is that they define most students will define and they give an example. You will still get your marks. But in description, it's not about definition. It's step-by-step -step yeah. explanation. Okay. So on your screen, I hope I've helped. Hello. Okay. On your screen, you can call us on 0302. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, your name again? Ajaysa Foku. Foku. Yeah, is there a question you want to try at the end of the day? <laughs> you lost Patricia. So on your screen, they say, look at the four drawings there. Identify the name. Identify the name the instrument shown in the diagram. C, D, E, and F. Then name the part I, I, I. I, 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 and IV. Name the ecological factors measured by C, D, E, and F. Then which of the instruments cannot be used in an aquatic habitat? You can call in using 0302-211-705 or 0302-211-706. You can go to our Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, or Instagram, or type Joy Learning TV. Put your comment there, and we'll... Salamatu. Yes. Yes, call next from? Please, Echimai. Echimai, yes. A question or you want to try a final of the day? Please, I want to try my answer on the question of the day. Yes, give it a go. Okay. So the first question says, ask, identify and name the instrument shown in the diagram. Yes. C is the rain gauge. Rain gauge. And D is the wind vane. Wind vane. And E is the aneroid, bar aneroid anemometer. Rather. Again, come again. The C is the the, the E is the anemometer. Anemometer, okay. And then the F 
Is a safety desk. Good, 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 good. Then, yes. The eye. Mm -hmm. The eye is a metal can. Okay, I accept it. Metal can. Or metal cylinder. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And the eye, eye is a measuring cylinder. I also accept that. And the eye, eye, eye is a funnel. Okay. And the uh, Ivy is the handle. <laughs> wow. Ivy, no, watch it well. I won't take handle for this. It's a hook. <laughs> I will still not take hook. <laughs> Go check our notes. I gave you a proper drawing and I stressed it. Go mm -hmm. again. Yes. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think you did well. You did so well. Almost yeah. everything is correct. Okay, let's jump to last one so that I'll continue. Okay. <laughs> Okay. The, ecologi the ecological factors measured by the instrument C, D, E, and F. Mm -hmm. C is used for measuring the, for measuring, is it the amount of rainfall? <laughs> yeah. Okay, rainfall. And the, the D is used to measure the direction of the rain. The D is used for measuring the direction of the rain. And the E is used for measuring the speed of the rain. And the safety disk is used for measuring the stability of is it stability of water. Or ocean. Right, well done, well done. And they said which of the instrument cannot be used in aquatic habitat? I think is a Try, try, give a guess. Okay. Ah, okay. Somebody's, hurry up, somebody's on the line. No, I can't give it to you. No. <laughs> well, let somebody call you, yes. An escola. An escola. Hello, an escola. Okay. So we got to see I I she almost got it. Left the last one. See I call us on 0302-211705. 0302-211706. As a way of advice, next week we go into the exams. Few things you have to remember. One, if you call in, yes. Salama to. Hello, sir. Yes. You didn't finish. You want to finish it. Is the anemometer? Okay. Listen to which of the instruments cannot be used in an aquatic habitat? Mm. That means water, like river, sea. You don't use it there. Then is the rain gauge. Okay. You see, among them, well, look at it. Well, which one can be used? It's a safety disc. Hold on. Listen to the question in the exams. Which one can be used in aquatic habitat? Look at it. Well, which one is used in measuring something aquatic habitat? Okay. okay. I'll answer you very soon. I was trying to help you know which one is used for. Once you know the one used in water, you know the rest that is not used in water. So I'll answer you. Okay. Now, my students, next week, Friday, we're going to face this paper. That's the first paper for science students. Okay. William. Hello, William. It's Lillian. Oh, okay, Lillian. Sir. Yes. Can you help us with CII? -I? -I. 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 Okay. Seems this question. So those who call in, I'll give you test questions. Now, listen. Few things. Don't panic. In exams. 
there are cheap questions, there are difficult questions. The first four questions carries, the section B carries 20 marks each. Choose two. Question five is for Ghana alone. Do Ghana. Don't try the question six. We won't mark it. Okay. Drawing, we've taken you through a title, a size. Draw according to what they've given to you. Use a ruler to guide rule guidelines. Label, not slanting it. Your drawing should not be woolly, not be curvy, no shading. These few things can get you five marks. The name, Akoto. Hello, Akoto. Yes, sir. Yeah. You are lucky to have a test question. Or you want to ask us a question for clarity? I wanted to answer the, the question, the previous question. Okay. The C I I. Okay. See, I is back on your screen. Yeah, I think it is E D E. Correct. That's what I wanted. So I was helping Salamatu to know the one that we use and the rest that we don't. If you don't mind, go on to the next sec uh, next part of it. Outline the method of using the C and E in taking readings. How do we use rain gauge to take a reading? How do we use the wind, the anemometer to take readings? Any idea? No, sir. Okay. No, okay. Sir. I'm even a starter. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, my students, do not rush. Do not rush, but follow instructions. Then, when they say table, usually we are going to write a constrained paper. A constrained paper means that on the paper, they rule lines for you to answer on it. And we'll take the section B or the written part and give you the section A to take away. Okay. So you have to take your time to write. Now, a few things. In classification, if they tell you to mention any organisms in one word, start with a capital letter. Make sure S is a big S. C is a big C. P is a big P. Don't write anything like Nideria, crap, and the C is small. It doesn't look big. It doesn't look small. We'll mark you down. Enoch. Yeah. Hello, Enoch. Hello, Enoch. Yes. Hello, can you mute your your feedback? Mm -hmm. hey. Enoch. Okay, call back later. So, salama to. Yes, please. Yeah, you're yeah, back again. Yes, please. I want to answer the question the day. The one you asked me about how to measure the part of using the. Okay. Instrument. Okay. So, the rain gauge. Yes, rain gauge. The instrument used is the rain gauge. So, you select an open area. Correct. Put the rain gauge in the soil. Yes. Leave for about 24 hours. That's a day. Mm hmm. Collect the water and record its volume in mm. That's millimeters. Okay. Then calculate the amount of rainfall using the formula. Rainfall is equal to D square H over capital D square. Good. That's a capital D stands for the diameter of the mouth of funnel. Yes. The small D stands for the diameter of measuring cylinder. And the H stands for the height of water in measuring cylinder. Okay. And... Uh, how to measure the speed of wind. Yes. So, the instrument used here is the anemometer. Correct. Expose the anemometer into an open field. Count the number of times the arm swings in one minute or a specified time interval. Repeat it for six times. Then. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes. And the precautions okay. to be taken when using the instrument name C. Mm -hmm. The uh, precautions. Yes, I'm listening. C is the rain gauge. So what yes. precautions should you take? Yes, please. Instruments will be placed in an open space to collect direct rainwater. 
Yes, but there's a precaution. Yes, Some things you do. When I was teaching, I mentioned it. When you look at the picture, you see the drawing a certain way. I think Enoch is on the line. He also wants to contribute. Is it Enoch? I think Enoch is on the line. He also wants to contribute. Enoch, I'm still... There. Yes, Enoch. There. Yes. A question or... Sir, I want to try the objective number okay. four. Okay. This one. Is it this one? The test questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, try question one, two, three, four. Which one do you want to try? Yes, sir. Kindly mute your... Sir, the, four. Four, okay. Mute your, your volume of the TV. You can hear me. Please, can you speak to you? <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Sir. River, lakes. Yeah, okay. So, my student, what I'm saying is that, one, when they ask you for one name thing, maybe... Endoplasmic reticulum. If you get it wrong, we'll give you wrong. One word, we don't play with it. Mostly start with capital, especially classification. Phylum, to start with P. Atropad, Salamatu, you are back. Yes, please. Yes. So I was talking about the precautions. Yeah. So the instrument should be firmly positioned to prevent being blown by rain. That is one. And the funnel should be well inserted into the measuring cylinder to ensure accurate measuring of collected water. Yes, and there's a major third point. It should not be pushed down to the level of the soil. If not, it will be flooded. So it's supposed to be a little bit up or above the yes. ground level. That was the key one we wanted. Mm. Uh -huh. So all that you said were true, but if you look at all drains, it's a little bit up. And as you said, we dig the ground a little bit and put it there. Okay. Yeah, so thank you so much. So the importance. Yeah. The importance of the search for raising with the ecological, factors measure, ecological factor measured by the instrument in C of, is of importance to the ecosystem. Yes. It affects temperature and affects movement of organisms. Okay. It affects humidity, which also affects transpiration. Okay. It determines the level of soil erosion. Okay, state, yeah, okay, left it to one. Yes. It determines stability of water bodies. Uh, you see how you put it? It determines, you put it well. It, it's what? Increases what? The stability of water bodies. Correct. That's how we mark. If you open it, leave it open for us, we'll take any action and not okay. give you the point. So, well done. Please uh, in form one. Wow. Then, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Yeah. They would call you. You are so far the one who answered most of the questions. So, yeah. Okay. So, to round up, it's been a fruitful day. There are a lot of questions. I know why, because next week, Friday, we're facing our paper. And a few ruses, have confidence, go through a lot of questions, use capital in most of our scientific words, uh, classification, then drawing, attack drawing. And although we are hard pressed with time, when they give a table of difference, state the two tables same and show us where the difference is. They all use, they use this and they don't use that. So, thanks so much for joining us. Hope to meet another time from myself and the team. It's a bye-bye for today.